As I mentioned last evening in concluding the last uh, talk, after the fourth jhanic uh, attainment, there are several possibilities. I mentioned uh, two of them last night, but there is another one, <laughs> three possibilities. <coughs> Let me mention the possibilities. One, the yogi can uh, proceed with uh, immaterial jhanas. Second, one cultivate uh, various supernatural powers. Third, one can uh, use that jhanic experience to attain supramundane attainments. There are, these are the three possibilities. When we look at the whole uh, <coughs> structure of jhanas, both material jhanas and immaterial jhanas, For the uh, material, even for the material jhanas, there are no step-by-step -step guidelines. But in, uh, in fine material jhanas, there is a clue for uh, following the steps. For instance, in uh, uh, one example is uh, one uh, restrain one's senses, observe the moral principles, and then uh, practice metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, four brahmaviharas, and then Buddha says go to a secluded place, quiet place, then is straight away gives the formula of attaining the first jhana. Quite secluded from sense pleasure, secluded from unwholesome state of mind, <coughs> one enters and dwells in the first jhana, which has uh, initial application of thought and sustained application of thought, with joy, happiness and concentration. Just straight away gives the formula. And today, when we try to teach jhana meditation, uh, because of uh, unfamiliarity with this practice, uh, naturally people expect us to give guidelines, step-by-step -step guidelines, which uh, we have to invent, we have to make. So what I told you, is what we find in various places. In commentarial material, <coughs> especially after the fifth century, after Venerable Buddha Gosa, uh, we find uh, using various subjects and how to use this subject, how to use casinos and, and so forth and so on to attain jhanas. <coughs> If you read sutras like Mahasatipatthana Sutta, <coughs> attaining four jhana is given, but not a method given there. Take Anapana Sati Sutta, you, I can name many sutras, but in none of these sutras, a step by step guideline is given. <coughs> so it is left up to the meditators up to yogis. So however we try to, you know, make a structure, a, a, a logistic plans to follow them and attain jhanas. But once we attain the first material jhana, then things are easy. 
because first from that attainment onward the steps are clear when we talk about immaterial jhanas it is even more confusing for immaterial jhanas there are no steps even to attain the first one which subject we should use can we after attaining the fourth jhana can we straight away proceed with the material jhana using the same subject that we used to attain fine material jhana for instance for to attain fine material jhana we may use uh for to attain the fourth jhana we may use the equanimity because metta karuna mudita doesn't work metta karuna mudita can reach you can bring you only up to the third jhana but to attain the fourth you got to have you got to you cannot use metta you got to use the uh equanimity fourth of the brahma vyaras but from that one can one may one may wonder can one go to find a immaterial jhana from the fourth material jhana straight away or is there anything else to do so commentary is especially when the buddha goes in his visuddhi magga he gives a way a method he says use one of the 10 kasinas one of the 10 kasinas what are the 10 kasinas out of 14 subjects of meditation given in visuddhi magga in um, anapana sati sutta we reads 42 subjects of uh, meditation and uh, however among them there are kasinas called 10 kasinas what is kasina is it coming from our kasin <laughs> no kasina in pali means entirety we use an object to represent the end something entire so represent to represent uh, entirety of something complete something so to represent the entire earth we might use earth kasina these are the 10 kasinas earth uh heat water air then blue red white uh and and, and yellow and the space and light these are the 10 kasinas they are called in pali patavi apote to vayo one what is called neela peeta lohita odata aakasha aloka these are the 10 kasinas now suppose we take uh, one of them say uh, what do you like earth kasina okay earth kasina earth kasina is uh, made of uh, uh, brown red color earth you take red brown or brown red you know uh, color very fine uh, clay very fine clay of that color and make a disk of 9 inches in diameter and you put it you have to make a disk in such a way that it will not fall off once you put it in front of you uh, 18 inches away from you you put this 
object and uh, focus your mind on it, keep your eyes wide open. As long as it is necessary for you to remember this object, this round disc. Once you remember it, you close your eyes and try to uh, uh, review it, try to look at it without opening your eyes. From your mind, look at it inside. And if it is not very clear, open your eyes and look at the external object again. And this external disk of clay is called preliminary or learning subject or learning object. Parikamma nimitta in Pali. And then you mem after you memorize, that memorized image is called Patibhaga nimitta, counterpart sign or counterpart object. And that disk, outside disk, is also called uh, Parikamma Samadhi. Samadhi means concentration. You focus your mind on that object. During the time you focus your mind on that object, you gain a degree of concentration, very superficial degree of concentration. Therefore, it is called Parikamma Samadhi. When you memorize it, focus your mind on the memory, that is called Patibhaga or, uh, or Patibhaga Samadhi, Patibhaga Nimitta, or Patibhaga Samadhi. So, and then you don't stay there, you go somewhere and keep focusing mind on the memorized image. And then, if you want to practice immaterial jhana, what you have to do is to mentally, you remove this image from your mind, you remove that image from your mind and focus on the space occupied by the object, by, by this memory. In your mind you know the object, you remember the object and also you try to forget the image of the object that you memorized and focus the mind on the space that was there, that was occupied by this memory. Now no longer you have the object, the, the, the me even memorized image. To do that, you got to do uh, uh, aru, uh, 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 rupa viraga bhavana. It is called rupa viraga bhavana. Rupa viraga bhavana means meditation. That means you got to think of the disadvantages of forms. Rupa viraga. Viraga means non-attachment, non-clinging. In order for you not to have clinging for any form, you got to think of the disadvantages of form. When we have form, form is subject to change, we fall sick, we will get angry, we have to use clubs and fight and knives and this and that. Because of the form, all kind of problems arise. We got to think about uh, the form. Uh, probably some of you who studied uh, Giriman and the Sutta, probably you may remember there are all kinds of disadvantages that we discussed, disadvantages of form. Adhinava uh, Sanya, it is called Adhinava Sanya. And Buddha said, Katamaj Bhikkhi Adhinava Sanya. Dhananda Bhikkhu, then he thinks of disadvantages of uh, 
eye disease, ear disease, nose disease, tongue disease, body disease, this and that, all kinds of diseases. So we got to think very systematically of the disadvantages of form of any type. And then you, when you think of the disadvantages of forms, that image that you had in your mind slowly fades away. Then you will have a space. And you focus mind on the space and then remove the boundary of the space. The, sp the space with the boundary is called paritta kasa. Paritta means small with boundary. When you remove the boundary, what, we, you, what you will have will be ajatakasa. Ajatakasa means boundless space. Ah, now you come to <laughs> immaterial, first immaterial jhanic object. This is how you got immaterial jhanic object. Then, what you do, there are four things to do. One is sabbasu rupa sanyanang atthangama. We got to think of uh, uh, abandoning going beyond the perception of forms, rupa sanya. Sabba so means completely, without keeping one scruple of form in your mind, even a concept of form, don't keep in mind. So we go beyond the concept of form. Sabba so rupa sanyanang atthangama. Atthangama means disappearing, fading away, non-existence. And then, patika sanyanam samatikkama. Patika, patika means contact. There are two types of contacts. One is called uh, uh, adhivachana sampasa, other is called patika sampasa. Adhivachana sampasa means uh, contact that we make through our senses. When we make contact through our senses, senses don't go and touch the object. Object reflects on the senses. Eye doesn't go and touch this object, <laughs> then we cannot see anymore. But I, the, re the object reflects on the eye. That kind of contact is called adivajana sampasa. That is called designation contact. But the mind directly contact object. That is called patika sampasa. That is uh, impingement contact. Now, patika sanyanang Attagama means one has to go beyond all these contacts, the sensory contacts or mental contact. And then, nanatta sanyanam amanasikara. Ah, that is another difficulty. Nanatta sanyanam amanasikara. One must not pay attention to any perception. No what's perception whatsoever. No attention. As I, rem as I mentioned several times in the past, only when we pay attention to something, that thing exists in us, for us, in our mind. When we do not pay any attention to anything, don't pay any attention to any perception, then no perception will be in our mind. 
And then the fourth condition is Ananto Akasoti Akasanam Chatanam to Sampaji Virati. Then, having done all these three things, the fourth thing one has to do is to think that the space is infinite. The space is infinite. Let me repeat the four things again. First, uh, Rupa Sanyanans Atthangama, we do not pay any, do not have any perception of any form. Secondly, Patika Sanyanam Samatikkama, no any kind of uh, contact, impingement contact or designation contact. And there is no any kind of other perception in the mind. Having done these three, the meditator will repeat the perception of infinity of space. Where this infinity of space came from? From that disk. You remove the, the form of the disk and take that space and mentally you expand the space beyond boundaries. You got to start from somewhere, that is why the disk is necessary. Otherwise, just to think of the in infinite space all of a sudden would not give you sufficient strength to gain concentration. With the concentration, you got to expand this space. When you do that, of course, your hindrances are already suppressed. You gain a very powerful concentration and you stay there as long as you can. Now, you just imagine, it is not that easy. The attaining the immaterial jhanas is the most difficult because of this extremely finest uh, levels of uh, consciousness, levels of perception. Uh, that is why it is called immaterial. Then, uh, when you attend the immaterial jhana, in, in, the, the first immaterial jhana, actually the word, even the word immaterial jhana is uh, not found in the texts, only we find in commentaries. In the text, what we find is uh, <coughs> arupa, chattaru arupa, for uh, formlessness. Arupa means formlessness. However, when you attain the first of these arupas or immaterial jhana, uh, just like material jhana, when you lose it, you reflect upon them, upon that attainment. There are two things in that attainment. You have um, deep concentration and equanimity. This equanimity is the same as the equanimity that you have in the fourth material jhana. The same concentration in the fourth material jhana and same, con uh, same uh, uh, equanimity in the fourth material jhana are carried over to the immaterial, first immaterial jhana. But when you lose it, you reflect, you remember how, how you attain it and you determine to attain it, determine how long you stay there and determined to come out of it. And then, when you repeat it over and over again, you will see a weakness of this uh, first immaterial attainment. What is the weakness? The perception of infinity of space, the perception. In order to attain the, spirit, uh, the immaterial jhana, you, you 
uh, meditated upon the disadvantages of forms. Now, in order to attain the second arupas, you reflect upon the disadvantages of perception. This perception uh, is deceptive. Perception is deceptive. It is not real. When you think of the deception, decep uh, uh, deceptibility or deception uh, nature of uh, uh, perception, uh, you begin to think uh, uh, consciousness without perception is even better. Consciousness without perception is better. And then you reflect upon the disadvantages of perception, and then the formula of the second arupas is very simple. Sabbaso akasanancharatanang samatik vattangama ananto vinyananti vinyanancharanang upasampaji vihar. You just don't pay attention to the infinity of space or the perception of infinity of space and then reflect upon the infinity of consciousness. We talk about infinity of consciousness. Consciousness is infinite. So you reflect upon the infinity of consciousness. And then attain the infinity of consciousness. Where is that consciousness come from? From the same immaterial attainment. Refined consciousness. Very deep consciousness. Without any object in it, just pure consciousness. People talk about pure consciousness. So long as they are in material objects, with material objects, they don't have pure consciousness. They, through the practice and training of our mind, we go to pure consciousness through immaterial attainment, or arupas, immaterial jhanas. Before that, we don't have a pure consciousness. Then, uh, when you reflect upon, when you attain it, attain in that again and again, uh, you begin to see even the pure consciousness seems to be uh, defective because uh, that consciousness is close to Im first immaterial attainment. Because of its proximity, it can get less powerful. So you see that as an disadvantage. So though you don't pay attention to it, then you see nothingness is even better. Even the pure consciousness, uh, since it is close to uh, uh, first immaterial jhana, uh, it is weak, but uh, nothingness there is nothing to worry about it. So you think of void, emptiness, nothingness. So, infinity of nothingness. And you attain that. After that, the mind keeps searching, looking for something else, even better. and you find disadvantage, defect, weakness of what you have already attained. Then you see nothingness actually is not really nothing. <laughs> then you have the perception of neither perception nor non-perception. 
I mean, these are very mind-boggling terms, let alone attaining them. Then you attain the same way as you attain the previous ones, attain the state of neither perception nor non-perception. Neither perception is, and non-perception is so difficult to explain. Uh, it's called neva sanya, na sanya, neither perception nor non-perception. Only through illustration you can understand it. It has been uh, uh, described through similes. One simile is uh, In the monastery, uh, a senior uh, monk asked a junior monk or novice to bring the arms ball. He said, uh, novice said, uh, Sir, there is uh, oil in the arms ball. Then the senior monk said, Oh, that's very good, my, my uh, oil is run out. I need some oil to my, 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 to fill my bottle. Then he said, "There is no oil, sir." So first he said, "There is oil." When he asked him to bring the bowl to fill his uh, bottle with oil, he said, "There is no oil." What do what does it mean? I mean, these two statements. First, he said there is oil because the arms bowl is smeared with oil. Just stain of oil is there. When he asked him to bring it to pour into a bottle, he said there is no oil because there is not enough oil to pour into something. Similarly, this, uh, this neither perception nor non-perception is, you cannot say there is totally Total is, perception is totally absent, completely absent. Nor can you say there is perception. Perception is, is there, you cannot use it for anything. Just like the oil smeared on the ball cannot be used for anything. It is just, uh, you know, stain of oil. Similarly, you hardly can say there is perception. Or also, you cannot say there is no totally, completely no perception. That is the state. So, now, this is how the uh, four immaterial jhanas are described and attained. Now, when we attain the um, fine material dhanas, what we did, as you remember, we uh, eliminated something and uh, kept something. We eliminated certain factors and maintained certain factors. When we went to the fourth material jhana, uh, we did not eliminate anything, we substituted something. What did we substitute? We substitute happiness with neither, neither a painful nor pleasant feeling. We substituted. The happy feeling is substituted by neither pleasant nor unpleasant feeling. and we maintain other jhanic factors. But in immaterial jhanas, they are completely, totally different, no substitution, no, no uh, uh, what you call, um, uh, elimination. Entirely different things we attain. For instance, when we attain the first immaterial jhana, we had the uh, perception of infinity of space. When we attain the second immaterial jhana, we had the 
infinity of space, infinity of perception. Not space, just perception. When we attain the third immaterial jhana, we have nothingness. And the fourth is neither perception nor non-perception. Excuse me? Yes. Infinity of consciousness. Infinity of consciousness. Right. So, uh, the four fine material jhana attainment is uh, its objects are uh, different, but the, the levels uh, are the same. That is uh, like four-story building. When you go from first story to second, the story's structure is the same. But the object in that uh, story, that uh, uh, fly, are different. That is, the jhanic factors in the first jhana uh, are different from the second jhanic factors. The third jhanic factors are different from the second jhanic factors. Fourth jhanic factors are different from the third jhanic factors. But the levels are the same, strong levels. But in immaterial jhanas, every attainment is finer than the previous one. It's like a, a cloth. You have a, a first attainment is a, a finer, sort of rough cloth. A weaver has woven a cloth which is rough using the same material. But the second cloth is fine. Third was, one is finer, the fourth is the finest. That means first immaterial attainment is rather rough, compared, you know, com comparatively rough, compared to the uh, higher ones. The second immaterial attainment is fine, finer than the first, third is still finer, and the fourth is the finest. Now, uh, these four attainments are not mentioned in every uh, discourse where jhanas are mentioned. In the sutras, uh, four jhana, when the, the, where the four jhanas are mentioned, the four immaterial jhanas are not uh, necessarily mentioned every place. Four immaterial jhanas, so four arupas are mentioned occasionally, very seldom, not as uh, common, commonly as fine material jhanas. Because fine material jhanas are uh, necessary factors to cultivate, to go to higher attainments of uh, enlightenment. For instance, uh, one does not have to attain any fine, any immaterial jhanas in order to practice vipassana. Not necessary at all. Perhaps because of this, many people, sometimes even teachers, vipassana teachers say, you don't have to practice jhanas to practice vipassana. Perhaps because of uh, the <coughs> unimportance of attaining immaterial jhanas. Immaterial jhanas are completely, totally, absolutely unnecessary 
to practice vipassana. But material jhanas are important. That is why material jhanas are mentioned more often than immaterial jhanas. Uh, this, is the, this is one possibility, that is, after attaining material jhanas, one can attain immaterial jhanas. The next possibility is, after attaining material jhanas, one can uh, cultivate, uh, one can use uh, material jhana uh, to cultivate insight. However, in uh, many sutras where Buddha has mentioned this, only these four jhanas, he said after four jhanas one can cultivate supernatural powers. But according to commentaries and sub-commentaries, you cannot cultivate supernatural powers without four immaterial jhanas as well. That means you have to have eight jhanas for, imma- for material, for immaterial, in order to cultivate supernatural powers. But almost everywhere where Buddha has mentioned only four fi- fine material jhanas, there is his, he mentioned after the fourth fine material jhana, you can cultivate supernatural powers. So he said, uh, in the fourth fine material jhana, there are eight wonderful qualities. I think I have mentioned them many times in the past. It is very, very important at this moment to mention them again. Eight wonderful qualities in the fourth fine material jhana. And these five, eight qualities that are in the fine material jhanas are not mentioned in any of these immaterial jhanas. Nowhere can you find them in immaterial jhanas. What are the eight wonderful qualities? Number one, pure. The formula goes like this. Evang parisuddhe, pariyodate, anangane, vigatu parkilese, mudubhute, khammanye, thite, ananjapatte. Uh, chittam asavakhe jnanaya abhininnameti Buddha said this the fourth material jhana which has these eight qualities will be directed towards the destruction of defilements I will talk about it uh, uh, maybe tomorrow, but I just want to mention only these eight qualities tonight. One is pure, parisuddha. Suddha is pure. Parisuddha means extremely pure. You know, excessively pure. In order to make it uh, stronger, Buddha used another word which is almost uh, synonymous with pure, parisuddha, that is pariyodata. Pariyodata, odata means white. When we mention four colors, uh, nila, pita, lohita, odata. Odata means white. Pariyodata means extremely white maybe as white as snow. If there is anything whiter than that, it is that white. Meaning, it is so clean and pure. Then, you know, he he used another word to qualify the same thing. That is anangana. Anangana means uh, stainless. No spots, no, uh, 
what you call spot, dirty uh, spots. Uh, no speckles, no dust, no stain, pure, clean. <laughs> then, Vigatu Upakilesa. Vigatu Upakilesa means, Upakilesa means uh, uh, mental tendencies. The tendencies are gone. Remember, the tendencies are gone temporarily only when we are in that state of meditation. Vigatu Upakilesa, Mudubhuta. Mudu means soft. Kammaniya. Kammaniya means pliable, flexible, elastic, can put into work. Tita. Tita means steady. Ananjapata, imperturbable. Now, just imagine, just remember these qualities and think of, e think of each of these qualities. And when we put all of them together, we, we understand, what we understand is this state of mind is perfect. At that moment, this state of mind is perfect. Perfect for what? Perfect not in itself. It is not perfect in the in the in the, the highest sense of the term. It may have uh, perfect too later on, like word perfect. <laughs> and that this is perfect enough for doing something with that. So Buddha said, when it is perfect enough to do something, that is, that is the time we use it for something. When it is perfect this way, we don't wait until its perfectness becomes weak for us to use it. When it is perfect, strong, most powerful and clean and pure, that moment we must use it. I say this because uh, um, in several places, in uh, especially commentaries, especially Venerable Buddha Gosa has said, you got to get out of that and use it for, for focusing mind on whatever you want to do. You come out of it and then use it to practice vipassana, to contemplate of on contemplate on anicca dukkha anatta, and so forth. When we uh, look at the formula, wording, uh, we don't find that meaning. What we find there is, when the mind is in that state, use it. When the iron is hot, hammer it to shape it up, to shape you, to bring it to whatever shape you want. Don't wait when it is until until it becomes cold. When the knife is sharp, before it becomes blunt, use it when it is sharp. Similarly, when the mind is clear, pure, strong, this and that, all wonderful qualities, that time use it. Here we have uh, extremely powerful concentration. The highest degree of concentration you can find in the fourth material jhana. And that is the concentration we have to use to focus 
on impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and selflessness. Now, at this level, we don't use any word impermanence. Impermanence is not a word. It's not a word. Although we use words to express it, but impermanence is not a word. Is it? It is an occurrence. It is an event. It is something happening. It is a flux. When mind is this concentrated, this pure, this powerful, it is this mind that can see impermanence. At the time we don't see impermanence. We can see the mark that impermanence has left behind. Impermanence leaves its marks behind and we see the marks of impermanence. How? I think my hair was dark. I've been thinking my hair, is, hair was dark. And all of a sudden I see some grey hair. And how does that happen? This grey colour, impermanence left this grey colour on my head. From that I know, ah, this hair has been changed. Otherwise I don't know the changing of my uh, colour of my hair. Impermanence has left this mark behind. And seeing these marks I know hair has turned into grey colour. It is impermanent. It is no longer blue, no longer dark, black. I think I tend to think my skin is very smooth and oily and very, you know, soft. All of a sudden I find big wrinkles <laughs> on my skin. How does that happen? Impermanence left this wrinkle on my skin. And from that I know the skin is impermanent. But when we have this powerful concentration, we don't have to wait for the impermanence to leave its marks behind. We can see impermanence as it is, it is working. Impermanence is working uh, very hard to leave this mark behind. <laughs> so, when we have this concentration, powerful state of mind, we can catch it, we can catch impermanence at work. We don't have to wait until it is gone. So, this is how, I talk about it tomorrow in more detail, this is how we use this st powerful state of mind to catch impermanence at work, unsatisfactoriness at work, selflessness at work. We don't have to wait till tomorrow to see them working if we use this kind of concentrated mind. We cannot use immaterial jhanic concentration to see uh, this impermanence, unsatisfaction and so forth, because that level of concentration we are completely lost. We are completely lost. We don't work with anything material, because we have gone beyond, we, we started saying, rupa sanyanang attangama, gone beyond all perception of form. Therefore, how can we see the impermanence of form in that level? Because we have gone beyond that level in our mind. Patikasanyanang samatikkama, we have gone beyond all contact. You know, impermanence 
is the deepest contact level. It contacts our senses, it has both contacts, impingement contact and designation contact, both contacts. And we are out of touch when we go beyond contact. So we cannot see impermanence. Similarly, unsatisfactoriness and selflessness. We cannot see them in immaterial jhanic concentration. That is why material jhanic concentration is absolutely important, necessary qualification to see, to practice vipassana. I think I should stop here now <laughs> and I will continue uh, this uh, from here, from this point onward, how to use this concentrate, this concentration to uh, develop uh, deep, true insight. I think this is enough for tonight. <laughs>